Hello. Welcome to Raymond Castile's Basement of Horror. This is the exciting season finale. I know it's been a few weeks. This has been a long time coming, but I think, I hope you'll understand as you watch this why it took so long. There's a lot of pieces to put together, uh, a lot of old video and narration and all kinds of stuff. And as I sit here recording this, most of that is ahead of me. It hasn't happened yet. I'm just starting to produce this episode right now. So I'm looking ahead at a difficult process to shoot this and edit it. And when it's all done, uh, I hope you'll enjoy it and hope you'll forgive me for the long gap between episodes. So it feels almost like a post-season special than the final episode of the season. And that's fine, if you want to look at it that way. Uh, well, let's, let's get on with this. This is going to be a long episode. We are going to talk about something I was involved in some, some years ago. And you may notice this poster behind me. This is something I made for a, uh, basically a club, an online club, a discussion forum called the Universal Monster Army, or the UMA, Universal Monster Army, the UMA. And uh, the UMA was started in 2002 by a gentleman named Terry Ingram. And I am, I'm going to look at notes. There's a lot. I have pages and pages of notes. Because there's a lot to get right. A lot of details. So Mr. Ingram started the UMA in 2002. It started as a Yahoo or Yahoo group. And then in 2007, it became its own forum. And it's still around to this day. Uh, throughout this episode, I might sometimes speak of it in the past tense because I'm not uh, actively involved anymore. I still post occasionally, like these videos, I'll post these videos when I make a new one, I'll post them on the UMA, as I do all over social media. But I used to be very involved. And so let me tell you a bit about how I got involved with that. So back in the 90s, you know how you, maybe you don't know if you're too young, you had dial up, you'd log on to the internet, and it would go like, and make all these crazy sounds, and there'd be like little windows open, like we're almost there, almost, you're online. Okay, great. It was, it was very primitive. Well, uh, companies like AOL and Yahoo had boards, like message boards, that were you know, built into their service. So you had to uh, be a member of AOL or Yahoo, Yahoo and sign in and navigate to these boards. AOL was like your online world, and everything you did, you did through AOL. And you'd go, if you want to look, look at movie stuff, you go to the AOL movie section. If you want to go to, like, look at collectible stuff, you go to the AOL collectible se se section. And if you wanted to uh, talk to other people, then there were communities on AOL that you would go to. And that's how it was before social media, back Internet 1.0. And I was a member of the Classic Horror Film Board, which is still around as a forum now, as an independent forum. But it was on AOL in the 90s when it started, and I was a member there in the early days of the Classic Horror Film Board. And then in the early 2000s, I discovered the UMA, which is on Yahoo at the time. And the way I discovered it was someone told me that 
there was some group that was using photos, my photos that I took of my toys that I had on my website, the Gallery of Monster Toys that I started in 1996. They were using my photos without my permission or without any credit. And I was like, oh, I can't have that. So I went to UMA, UMA and uh, saw my photos and I had to speak to the manager about this. And I contacted Terry and I said, you can't do that. I don't want you using my photos. Um, and he, he said, oh, you know, I understand. I'm sorry. We, we'll take care of that. But then I, I looked around at UMA and I said, hey, this looks like a cool place. This was again back in the Yahoo days. And uh, I said, I think I'll stay here and I'll, I'll, I'll join. So I became a member. I started joining the discussion. And then eventually I became a moderator. And uh, I, I was, became one of the, the team of people who really ran the UMA. Terry was always the, the owner, the leader, the president. But then he built a team around him of moderators, and they did more than just moderate. They were involved with planning, planning the direction and the future of the group, planning fundraising, planning extracurricular activities. And for a while, it was it was a real culture, it was a real community, and it still is, but I mean, it was a different one when I was there. And, and that's okay, now it's different people running at different people participating and it's it's its own thing and it's it's different and that's fine but for a while i was one of the moderators and we moved from yahoo to this new uh independent forum that we set up this this where the group had its own website its own didn't have to depend on another company like yahoo and then it really exploded I don't remember how many members we got, but we, for a while, for several years, it was just booming with lots of participation, and it was growing all the time. Growing maybe a little too much, faster than we could handle. And eventually, we came up with the idea of, why, why don't we start a convention? Monster Bash was really big with classic monster fans, and that was kind of our model. Why don't we do something like that, like Monster Bash? And we thought about how we could rent a hotel, uh, like a you know banquet banquet room in a hotel, and have everyone come and kind of like Mego Meet. If you've ever heard of Mego Meet, kind of like that, only for monsters, where it was not a big convention. It was a smaller scale thing for a particular group of people with a shared interest, not like a bigger horror convention, a smaller thing where maybe just like a couple hundred people would come instead of a thousand people or maybe not even that many, maybe 75 or 100 people, you know, a smaller scale deal. So we thought about that and we looked into it and it just wasn't going to, it wasn't practical. We realized, yeah, we don't want to get into the convention business. So we thought, well, why don't we have a, a table at another convention? And again, we kept thinking about Monster Bash. That was our, our model. We thought, we'll have a table at Monster Bash. What are we going to do at this table? We'll sign people up to be part of the group. Well, how are we going to sign people up? We kind of have to have a computer there, and they have to be a member. Okay, we'll just promote the group. Well, why would they? We'll just, are we just going to have like a tablet? I don't know. What? That's not a... That's not uh, special enough to have a table at a convention. That's, we have to have something fancy in that. Well, we're collectors mostly. It was a very collector-oriented group. Why don't we have monster toys, you know, collectibles on display that'll attract people to the table, and then we'll tell them about the UMA. Uh, okay, so we started going with that, and then that idea started getting bigger and bigger. And then we thought, why, don't we, why do we need a, t- a table per se? Why don't we have a, a display? And then this idea of the UMA display was born. The UMA toy tour, the traveling museum exhibit. And uh, this became a project that I spearheaded uh, over several years. I organized through the UMA with the help of many people. 
I organized this, uh, I led this organization to, to put on this traveling museum style exhibit of classic monster toys, mostly from the 60s and 70s, but we also had some 80s in there as well. So this was the monster craze that I've talked about on the show before from the uh, early 60s to the early 80s, roughly, and everything, all the, the memorabilia and merchandise and toys that were part of that would be on display in a museum-style exhibit. Not like a, not like a dealer table at a, at a show, uh, like, like a toy show, not a, not a dealer table, not even cabinets like you might see like a display cabinet with stuff in it no bigger than that we really wanted to make a a museum style exhibit uh like going to the natural history museum and seeing the kind of displays they had there and something interactive something where the 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 uh, fixtures were manufactured especially for the exhibit uh, and didn't look like just a bunch of display cabinets with some toys in it. So this was a very ambitious idea and looking back at it uh, it seems crazy that we even were able to do as much as we could. Um, it was, I think it was too ambitious, honestly. It, we really had no business succeeding at this. This was ridiculous. The more I think of it, <laughs> it was. I'm glad we we didn't know how stupidly ambitious it was because uh, we wouldn't have done it. But we embarked on this project, and amazingly, somehow, some way, we actually succeeded. And this was before. This is before Kirk Hammett's traveling display of, of monster collectibles. You may have seen stories about that online, pictures of it. This is years before that, years before some other similar displays that I've seen online of, of you know, monster memorabilia that are done in kind of a museum style. Years before any of that. This was, I, I cannot think, and I did look and try to see if there was any anything before this, I cannot think of anything like what we did that existed before our traveling toy display. I mean, if you know, someone out there knows of something, show me some pictures of it. Uh, But there was nothing that I've encountered searching to see if anyone did this before us. That was a, a true museum style, seriously done exhibit that was... Uh, that dealt with this stuff in a historical way, chronologically, with text panels and the history of it, and manufactured fixtures and nicely arranged exhibit pieces and interactivity with audiovisual elements uh, spanning decades, like our display did. I can't. I've never found any anything that existed before this. So it was very special for its time. Other things have come since then, particularly the Kirk Hammett display. So it's been done better than we could have done now much, with much more money. But I will contend that we were first in doing this kind of display. So, um, well, let me talk about how, uh, the display itself. Um, a gentleman by the name of John Mitchell, who was a member of the UMA, he designed the fixtures. Uh, these, they have ultimately were black cabinets and these connecting panels with, where we had the, uh, the text and some video screens and other windows. It was. It consisted of f- four, four towers and two connecting panels. I don't know how many feet long this thing was. Thirty feet, I think. I think each section. There's two sections that are 15 feet wide each, I think. 
and usually it was it was in a L shape, but it could be configured different ways. Uh, John Mitchell had done work for the St. Louis Science Center and other museums, professional museum style exhibits, and he did a lot of work with conventions, uh, fabricating things for conventions. So he knew his stuff, and luckily he was part of our group. So he designed these fixtures, and he and I met at like bookstores and coffee shops, and we went over the plans and we'd discuss it. And, Oh, he drew up the blueprints, and then I went into, I think it was PowerPoint, and recreated his blueprints in PowerPoint to scale, and then I populated it all with uh, the text and pictures of the toys and everything. And remember, this was like this was early two thousands, two thousand, I don't know, four when we started planning this, because it was two thousand six when it came to fruition finally so 2004 or 5 is when we started working on it um so I, I made a replica in powerpoint so you could zoom in all the way in and read the text and look at the toys individually and it's surprising how close to reality that powerpoint replica that model ended up being because the finished thing ended up being very very close to what was on the computer then we started fundraising, and um, I put forth uh, a fair amount of money to get it off the ground, but other people pitched in. Um, that first year was all just kind of out of, out of pocket. We didn't really do fundraising. We did, we did a little, but I put a, a good chunk of money out to get, get it rolling. And the first year was kind of shaky. The f uh, we... We appeared at Wonderfest in Louisville, Kentucky. I believe that was our first one, first time out with this. And the the we didn't get the right paneling. It was still the black paneling. We got brown, not deliberately. It was it was a problem where we couldn't get the black paneling. Oh boy, we didn't have the window plexiglass. We had to get that at the very last minute, I mean literally last minute, like an hour before showtime. Um, just all kinds of things went wrong, but somehow, somehow we got together just in time, and we opened the doors, and I'll tell you more about the layout in a second. People fluttered in, and it was a big hit, thank goodness. Everyone, no one cared about the brown. We cared about that, but public didn't care. No one cared about the brown uh, <laughs> paneling or anything else. Because no one, had, no one had seen anything like this. I'm not going to be humble about this. No one had ever seen anything like this display. Since then, yeah, it's not, you know, today it wouldn't be a big deal. That, at that time, no, the, no one had ever seen anything like this. These toys, this is, this is uh, I mean, eBay was already around, but it wasn't what it is today. There was no social media. It wasn't as common to even see images of these toys, let alone see them in person. And it's still not common to see all these things in person, in, in good condition, presented this way, presented professionally, with care and with context. This was a, a new thing that people were seeing. So... <clears throat> Like I said, the first time was at Wonderfest, and we, we, we did Wonderfest in 2006, 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010. We also did Wonderfest is in Louisville. We also did Monster Bash in Pittsburgh in 2006, 2007. I think that's it. We did Archon in St. Louis one year. I don't remember what year that was. We did Mask Fest at Horror Hound, Indianapolis, 2010, 2011, and 2012. And we did Monster Palooza in Burbank in 2012. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, I think. 12 appearances, 12 stops in Louisville, Kentucky, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, St. Louis, Missouri, Indianapolis, Indiana, and Burbank, California. 
So this display, it wasn't the same fixtures all the time, I'll, I'll get into that, but this toy tour, this toy exhibit, traveling toy exhibit, it got around, all around the country. The only thing, uh, the only regret we had, I think we really wanted to, wanted to do um, chiller theater or something in, in the New York area. Um, and we, we need to get all the way to the East Coast, because we did West Coast. We, we, it would have been nice to do the East Coast, but we just couldn't make that happen. But we got all over the Midwest, that's for sure. And we got East, like Pittsburgh is, yeah, yeah, I don't know, I guess it's not really East. It's mid, it's Northern Midwest. But, uh, wow, I mean, five states, that's that's pretty good from 2006 to 2012. And just to, let, let me talk about all the people involved, just to make sure I, I don't leave anyone out. So as I said, Terry Ingram, he ran the UMA. He, he uh, it was his, he started, he founded it, he ran it. And he still does to this day. He still owns the UMA. Bobby Beeman, and, and Terry was very involved with the display donating toys, setting up the fixtures, you know, traveling around with it. Uh, very hands-on with the display. Bobby Beeman donated toys for the display and also helped with the setup and uh, transportation and storage. He helped, uh, he helped store the, the panel and the fixtures for a while. Jeff Prepisich was involved with fundraising and making things to sell to help raise money to pay for the display. And he was also involved with transportation and storage. For a while, he had the fixtures. So for a while, Bobby had them. For a while, Jeff had them. For a while, John had them. These big fixtures, they, they're they not easy to store. Um, I think Bobby still has them. I think Bobby is the last one they ended up with, and he, I think he still has them. Uh, Rob Tulo, he was involved with uh, organizing uh, online with the UMA. Andy Williams, he was he donated toys and he helped with setup, and we all helped watch over the display like during the show hours. We were all there like ambassadors. And I'll, I have a button that we wore. Uh, that identified us. We had UMA t-shirts, and we had buttons. Uh, Max Cheney, he helped with setting up, and, and he helped with watching, and you'll actually see him in, the, in some video in a minute. He helped with watching over the display and talking to people. Uh, he, was, he was very instrumental in uh, promoting the display. He was very um, had a knack for uh, what I want to say this he was very social but also online he would do interviews and and he would get in, in contact with these different groups where you know some of us might be a member of one or two but he would be able to connect with multiple groups and, and help promote this kind of a cross culture kind of thing to different demographics that wouldn't necessarily hear of it otherwise. John Mitchell designed it, fabricated it, helped set it up, helped store. Richard Olson did a lot of graphic work uh, on the fundraising items, helping us create things to sell to help raise money for the display. Dan Roebuck, he was very helpful in supplying toys to and masks and things to put in the display, and also heading, helping to set up the display at MaskFest. Elizabeth Haney and her husband Dave were uh, very involved in the setup, and also in fabrication uh, in some of the later display stops in the later years. Uh, I'll mention her again later, where she was very involved with helping when we started to experiment with different types of fixtures and kind of got away with got away from the towers and everything. Started going to other formats. She was very involved with 
with uh, helping to organize and conceive of these different display alternatives. Robert Taylor was another moderator at the UMA and was very involved with uh, you know, helping gather support for the project. Brian Kallenberg helped set up at several shows, and I still see Brian like a horror hound. He's always at horror hound. I still see him, but he helped us set up many times. Clint Baruki. I don't. I've, I hope I'm pronouncing that. B o r u c k i. Clint Baruki. He and his team from Acme Design Inc. in Elgin, Illinois. They designed and fabricated some of the display fixtures for our later shows that I'll get into. And uh, the show we couldn't have done this without the people who who ran these shows and, and let us because we were always guests. We didn't pay for this stuff. They, we were we were always guests of the show uh, when they would give us free rooms and free space to set this up. So at Monster Bash, Ron Adams uh, organized Monster Bash. Our liaison at Wonderfest was Dave Conover. I know there were other people running Wonderfest, but he was the one we dealt with directly. Uh, at Archon, John was John Mitchell was one of the people who helped uh, run that show at the time. He wasn't the guy who ran the show, but he was our liaison. So I don't know who was the organizer. I can't think of his name. I didn't really deal with him directly for him. I dealt through John. Eric Austin organized Maskfest, and Nathan Hanneman organized Horror Hound. And Maskfest was a show within a show, and it's still going, going strong. Maskfest is part of Horror Hound. So Eric and Nathan ran that. And Elliot Brodsky runs Monster Palooza in Burbank. Well, it's not in Burbank now, in California. Elliot Brodsky. So all these people gave us this free space and made us guests of the show. So we had our hotel rooms comped. If we had to pay for all that, we couldn't have done this. So they were kind of like silent sponsors in a way. Uh, Without their in-kind sponsorship, we couldn't have pulled this off. So what you're going to see in a minute is video of the 2007 UMA Toy Tour display, which I think is the definitive one. Uh, That was the second year. That's when we had the proper black fixtures. Uh, We had all the, everything assembled the way we wanted it. Uh, And and it was the the classic... uh, display the original layout now after that uh it the display took some different forms which i'll I'll talk about after you see this video so what you're going to see is archival video most of which i shot in 2007 this is wonderfest Louisville, Kentucky, 2007. I don't remember what month, but it uh, uh, probably around Memorial Day, you know, either like the week before or after Memorial Day in 2007. <clears throat> and it was it was really busy all weekend long, but there was a, a period, I think it was right after the Rondo Award Ceremony, which is always takes place at Wonderfest. And right after that ceremony, there was kind of a quiet time where people were still sort of um, recovering from that event and figuring out where where to go next. And I took advantage of that to shoot some video of the display. And I, I thought at the time that I would do something like I'm doing now, but it's taken, oh, what, 13 years. To get around to it, to have the proper context, the proper platform to do it. 
So, now this is standard definition. This is not high def. This is shot with an old camcorder. It's going to look like heck. It's not going to look wonderful. It's not going to look like, you know, if I shot it today with a modern, with an iPhone or something contemporary, it's not, not going to look as good. So just understand that. Uh, you're going to see a lot of Max, Max Cheney, who I mentioned earlier, he was watching the display at the time, standing behind our, our table, because we had the display, and the, but we also had a table where we had uh, fundraising items and other things on display, and I'll show you some of the fundraising items uh, after the video. And he was very good at, at like meet and greet and talking to people. And he, that was his his talent, it still is. Um, but other times a day, I'd be there. Terry would be there. John would be there. Uh, maybe Bobby or just anyone. I mean, just over the years, Andy, Bobby, Dan. I mean, a lot of people. Jeff, you name it. Uh, Elizabeth the whole group really pitched in and and were present at these shows talking to people and talking about the toys and explaining what all this is talking about the uma so we all all took turns doing that but in the video you're going to see uh max is at the table and you're going to hear his voice and see his hear, hear his voice a lot and see his face a few times So, let's roll the tape. As I said, we were in the saddle and sirloin room, which was closed off from the rest of the convention area, and we were adjacent to a room that had movie props and costumes and dioramas. And you had to go through that room to get to our room, but that's okay, because the, the doors were very close together. So as you entered the dis the uh, movie prop room, immediately you saw the door to our display room. So a lot of people uh, were, were flooding in the door to our display room. You could see it from the hallway as you walked by. This is what it looked like entering our display room. As you walked in, you saw the toy cabinets, but also you saw all this imagery on the walls. Posters made from Remco and Ahai monster packaging, Monster Old Maid, Super 8 movie boxes, etc. You can hear Max talking to someone at the table. We wanted to create a visual impression right away as soon as you entered the room that separated you from the world of the convention and got you into a kind of cloistered atmosphere. This was a quiet hour, not a lot of people in the room. That's why I took this opportunity to shoot the video. It was a madhouse most of the day. You can hear Zachary Lee on the TV going, ha, 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 ha. Zachary Lee was a classic horror host. He was really one of the original horror hosts. And you'll see him in person later in this video. <laughs> Those Ahai and Remco posters were made by photographing the toy packages rather than scanning them. They were very large, high-res photos, and you saw the, the Remco posters in a previous episode. Here we have some 60s toys. A lot of this came from Terry Ingram's collection, a lot of the 60s toys. I was more the 70s toys, and the 60s toys were more from Terry. 
The 60s were the golden age of monster collectibles, the original monster craze. Here we have Soki's pencil sharpeners, glasses, three ring binders. All of this is original, there's no reproductions. These flicker rings, I believe, were from Bobby Beeman. He was really big into these flicker rings at the time. The faces change as you look at them from different angles, and these were sold in vending machines. This window has the AJ Renzi Monster Mobile, which you saw on a previous episode. And also, uh, Mattel Talking Herman Monster Doll and Puppet. Here's a nice set of Elwar monster buttons, ice cream spoons, and a Wolfman candy box. This TV set showed monster movies and Zachary Lee and other monster kid programming continuously all weekend long. These are a few of my Aurora Monster model built ups. And here is an original Aurora Gigantic Frankenstein. This is not a reissue. This is original. I believe this came from Terry's collection. This is Famous Monsters issue number one, the very first issue of Famous Monsters of Filmland. That Dracula character on the TV screen is Barry Atwater, the actor who played the vampire in the Night Stalker TV movie. And this is a, a weird little introduction that was added to the beginning of Dracula AD 1972. More beautiful 1960s toys with an emphasis on more three-dimensional figural toys. And we'll see more of all these windows in more detail later on. Here 
here you can see the transition from the 60s to the 70s. Looking at these two towers together, you can really see how the one decade transitioned into the other. And a few more people are starting to enter the room. This is my Remco monster set that you saw on a previous episode. Same ones, same toys. A window of Godzilla and King Kong toys from the 1970s. I really miss that King Kong Against the World game. I sold it a few years ago. Original Mego Mad Monsters and Ahai Monsters. This is where the whole 8-inch monster phenomenon started. These two lines, Mego and Ahai. Here we have more Ahais, and now we also have some Tomland monsters. Back to the 60s, we have a Holy Grail, a Frankenstein head speaker. There's actually a, a speaker in that blow molded head, and you can plug it into a radio or a stereo and listen to music through Frankenstein's head. Now here we have another holy grail behind the speaker. It's a Marx battery operated Frankenstein. This is a blow molded yellow Frankenstein bank. It's articulated, it's, the arms are articulated, and it looks kind of like the gigantic Frankenstein. This is a holy grail piece. It belonged to Terry, and he was very proud of it. There was a King Kong made in the same style and uh, Frankenstein and Kong came in black and yellow. A set of Pez dispensers. A set of original orange and teal Marx monster figurines, or cinema creatures as Marx called them. And also some NPC pop-top horrors next to them with some unbreakable, weird NPC figures on the card behind them. You can hear the crowd picking up in the background. nineteen sixties Ben Cooper monster costumes. And some mini monster baby dolls. I think these were made by Ideal. A lot of great stuff hiding around the corners in these windows. I sold the next to last one. I sold the last one. Yeah, we're through it. And you just heard my voice talking about some buttons we were selling as a fundraiser. Here is the Frankenstein Carnival doll. This was in our, this was on Basement of Horror in the season finale last year. But but this one belongs to Terry. This is not mine. And we have a maniac mummy transfer in the background. Here is a beautiful set of Ahai monsters that I no longer own. I call this the Style A series, though I don't know which really came first or second, but I call them Style A. They are more detailed and serious looking than other Ahai variants.
And here are the Tomland Famous Monsters of Legend. A nice set on Combex cards. These are the same ones that you saw on Basement of Horror last season. And this is a 1975 Creature from the Black Lagoon plaster casting set by Rapco. Rapco made a lot of plaster casting sets. These are what I call the Style B series of Ahai Monsters. Though I think they, these probably came out first, based on what evidence we have. No one really knows. These are a little more doll-like, with softer details than the other series. And this is the set that I still own. Here are the Mego Mad Monsters, a boxed set and a loose set. I still have the loose set, but I sold the box set. I never really loved the Mad Monsters, even as a kid, I was never really into them. I always preferred the Ahai monsters. And then after that, the Lincoln monsters. I doubt I'll ever own another boxed set of Mego Mad monsters. You can see my childhood Ahai creature standing up there. These 1970s Aurora Glow Kits are all original. I built and painted all of these. Then we have some monster scenes and monsters of the movies. These are not mine. Uh, I don't remember who they belong to. The monster scenes were smaller monster kits that were very controversial in their time for including torture scenes and scantily clad female figures. Here is the Aladdin Universal Monsters lunchbox from 1979. I did an entire episode on this lunchbox earlier this season. Here is my good old carded Ahai creature. This is the same one I still have. Hauling this around the country was a big deal for me, considering it's uh, a carded figure and could be easily damaged. I mean, the and this is something I do not have anymore. A genuine carded female Ahai creature. This is not a repro card, this is a real card. I still have a female creature on a repro card, which you saw last season, but this one is on a real card, and I don't have that anymore. Having these two carded Ahai creatures together side by side was a big deal. Information panels talking about the eras of the monster craze, the 60s and the 70s. A set of Vix Novelty reissue A High Jigglers on cards. More rubber monster toys. These dark ones are Mexican bootleg jigglers molded off the Aurora model kits.
Then we have a trio of very rare monster jigglers. These are big and heavy and oily. Not much is known about them, but you'll see these on an episode sometime in the future. Arapco 1970s Wolfman plaster bust that's been painted and a pair of 1970s Dracula stuffed dolls. <laughs> and we just had a couple episodes on the 1980 Remco monsters. Here's the set of the big monster figures in boxes. Did a whole show on these. It's nice to see them displayed all together like this. These are 1976 Mego King Kong toys. Both the big stuffed Kong and the King Kong Against the World boxed game behind him were made by Mego. This ideal Frankenstein scare cycle was added at the last minute. Obviously it doesn't go with King Kong and Godzilla. Lots of great Godzilla toys. The GLJ carded Godzilla Bendy, a Mexican bootleg Aurora Godzilla Jiggler, Mattel Popey Godzilla's gang figure in a bag, Mattel Shogun Godzilla, Ben Cooper Godzilla costume. All this stuff is from the 70s. By now there were more people coming into the room. I loved seeing parents bringing their children to see these old toys. People of all ages really loved the display. Here is Max watching our information table. He also sold fundraising tchotchkes from this table. Are you enjoying it? Pardon? Are you enjoying it? Oh yeah. I imagine you remember all of those items. Do you look like you're my age? We had buttons, clocks, and other items that we made as fundraising items to help finance this display. And this is a very rare 60s Frankenstein target game. It came in handy for recreation during slow periods. This is Max on the left, and on the right is David Colton. 
the former front page editor of USA Today. He's now retired. David is the organizer of the Rondo Awards, and he's one of the founders of the Classic Horror Film Board. David is the one who coined the term Monster Kid. <laughs> Together again. It's a strange reunion. That was unbelievable. Horrible. Just moments, Fascinating. hours ago, he was in a bag. I was sacked. <laughs> I'm originally sack. from Baghdad, but now I live in Hackensack. It's highly unusual. They're talking about a skit they just performed at the Rondo Awards ceremony earlier that day. David was one of several notable visitors to the display over the years. Here is the legendary TV horror host, Zachary, whose program we were playing on the TV. Terry Ingram shot this video of Zachary's visit to the display room. All these guys ship these toys in for their collections. Visiting the Universal Monster Army toy display 2007 at Louisville. That was Terry's voice. You want to visit the display? Stay in the front of the display over here, maybe? Right here, Zach, by the TV. Definitely. Get a good picture of it. Very good picture. This is why. Oh, they're a little shocked. Okay, okay, okay. I'm one of the people who uh, helped organize this. Uh, it's this was. <laughs> but, uh, you know, this is a very good. This is what is known as holding forth. This, <laughs> this is a very good. Uh, is there sound on this station? Yeah. It's on. Oh, he makes well for us. Good times. <laughs> This is like making it, making it up as you go along. Oh, yes. oh, oh, she had a great collection there. Yeah, I have. It's, it's a lot of fun. I wasn't the Zachary passed away in 2016 at the age of 98. This is Bob Burns, another legendary figure in horror and fantasy fandom. Bob is a super collector and an archivist of iconic film props. He was a special effects makeup artist and a gorilla suit actor in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Bob visited our display at multiple shows, and we were always tickled to be in his presence. This is so much you can what can you say? Exactly. You know? uh, that's what we're trying to do is you know, you go to the dealer's room, you see one or two of these, yeah. but this oh, is where yeah. you see it all. Yeah, but yeah, and the thing is here, they're, they're just presented so nicely too. It's great stuff. Oh my god. Oh my god. memory just brings back to me. Because <laughs> I got most of this stuff when it was new, you know. Yeah, that was yeah. just a I was a young snapper then. But that's been a while back. <laughs> Oh, uh, this, this is, you guys, you're going to Monster Bash too, right, with it? Yes, yep. we are. Are you going to be there? No. I can only do one show a year now. I'm not, my health is <coughs> not that good. No, I'm just, <laughs> I'm old. That's just all. I'm just plain old. Oh, God. Oh, God, I never saw this guy. That's really cool. Probably making one that big. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is cool. Oh, man. Yeah, some of these things are, we don't even know. It meant a lot to us that he was impressed with our display. His collection is extraordinary. He owns the original 1933 King Kong armature, original Jack Pierce, Frankenstein, Wolfman, and mummy prosthetic appliances, and a whole, whole lot of other stuff. Are you still awake? I hope so. Well, I hope you got some enjoyment out of that. I was really... <laughs> surprised and, and kind of excited to find that footage. Uh, I knew I'd shot something during the show. I, I remember shooting a little bit, but I, I didn't realize I'd shot so much and, and had shot it 
obviously with the intention of editing it together. And at the time, there just never was the opportunity to do anything with it. So I thought, well, now I've got the opportunity, so let's put it together and make something out of this. So what you just saw was as close as, as possible to approximating what it was like to actually visit that display and walk into the room and look around and see all the stuff and look at all the windows. I don't know if uh, it really uh, got across the multimedia aspect of the display. You saw the TV. Uh, now, I, I think you noticed that there was like a picture of a TV. I actually went to a television collector, a guy who collects TV sets and saw his collection. He has a warehouse of vintage TV sets and I wanted a TV that was a certain era since that was uh, in the 60s section. I wanted a, a 1960s TV. So I, I looked at some different TVs in his collection. I photographed different ones and then I showed them to the, the administration group at UMA as we were planning this this event and uh, we discussed it and decided on that particular TV. So that's how much thought just went into the TV, that picture of the TV set to get the right TV. And then of course it was cut out and then there was a, a real TV behind it. And it was old school. We were playing video cassettes. I think it was a TV VCR combo. They used to have those, like this TV and then the VCR built in. I think that's what it was. So we had VHS cassettes that we had to change uh, every other hour throughout the weekend <coughs> uh, or, or rewind it and, and play the same one again. Then we had, uh, and I don't know if it was the same year or if this was a different year, but I think it was the display we just saw in the video. There was a, an audio component and Max actually worked on that. Uh, where we had, a, in fact, he had like an announcer voice and everything where he introduced different uh, horror or monster related uh, novelty songs and musical things and, and went on a little journey of monster related music from, I guess, like the 50s and 60s. Uh, I don't know exactly what the, what the range of years was, but it was mostly 50s and 60s. But he was sort of like a, a DJ kind of hosting the thing in between each song, he would introduce it and talk about it. And so we had that in the cabinet and you, we had uh, uh, headphones that you could put on and listen to that. And that was going on a loop. The headset was uh, an authentic 1960s vintage headphone set that I, I bought specifically for the display. Uh, because I wanted everything, I wanted that part of the display, everything involved with it to be vintage, to be 60s. So the TV image had to be 60s and the headphones had to be 60s. And if I remember correctly, th this was a minty set of headphones. They actually had the original box and everything that I bought for this. I don't know what became of those headphones. I probably still have it somewhere. I don't know. So we, we had that multimedia uh, element and, and we expanded on that over the years some years more successfully than others trying to bring in video and audio and later on the computer and interactivity with the computer well let me do a little show and tell here so we had these little tchotchkes these little premiums that we made to sell to raise money to help us finance the display Here's a clock. This isn't the only one like this we did. We, we did a number of things like this. This is a clock, especially made for the display, the, the table that you saw in the video. You saw some of these for sale. And if I remember correctly, it was Jeff that made this. I'm really cautious about crediting, th like in the video, when I originally planned that narration, I was identifying who, who owned each toy. Like, this toy's Terry's, this toy's Bobby's, this toy's mine. And I abandoned that for the most part because I, I would just make a bunch of mistakes. I would be misidentifying toys. Just understand that at least half the toys in that display were not owned by me. Most of the 60s toys were Terry's, Terry Ingram. And some of that was also Bobby's. 
and most of the 70s toys were mine. And there might have been a couple things that other people donated, but that was mainly it. And as the years went by, we had more and more people donating toys to show in the display. So early on, it was mostly Terry and I with maybe a toy or two from someone else. And then as it went along, we had more and more people as it became better known and then there was more notoriety and it became more popular. People wanted to be involved with it. So we had more people uh, supplying toys to show in the display. Uh, and so later we had many people, different people, supplying toys. So you couldn't simply say it's this this guy and this guy. It would be several different people uh, donating toys. So <clears throat> here's here's a clock, and uh, it says it's time for classic monster toys. It's got the oh it's got the old group URL the Yahoo URL uh, movies.groups.yahoo.com slash group slash universal monster army so that's way back it's old 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 this is dated 2007 on the clock so this corresponds with the uh, with the video you just saw it was for that display from 2007 Remember that the first one was 2006, and then 2007 is the one we just looked at. So there's a clock. As I said, I believe that's Jeff Pripisich who created that. I could be mistaken. I think that's who did that. It's been many years. I don't remember everything very well, but... Here's a, I said that we had uh, buttons. This was a, a button that we wore, some of us anyway, that identified us. We also had uh, UMA t-shirts. Here's a toy collector button, official monster toy collector button. And that wasn't for sale, that was just for us to wear. Now these were actually for sale. I really like these. Um, I'm trying to see who. Oh, there. Well, anyway, <clears throat> here's some buttons. Okay, so th these are interesting because they're double-sided. If I remember correctly, yes, these are double-sided. So. Uh, ha! So you have actually the same images on both sides of the button. So in other words, with these buttons, you don't have like a little uh, magnetic rectangle or square. You have another button, and they clip together. And you can decide whether you want the 60s toys or whether you want the 70s toys facing forward. There's a lot of glare. I don't know if this looks good or not. Um, oh, wait a minute, did I do 70s twice? This is 70s, obviously. Um, this is 60s. Here's the 60s. The 60s side. And the 70s side. I think I think Richard Olson did these. I'm pretty sure it's Richard Olson. And it's got a cool little background insert and a lot of detail there. So I, I really like I think this was my favorite of the premiums we did. We did a lot of different little things. I think this was my favorite, these buttons. I just like the package. It's really cute and the clever idea. It had double-sided double 60s and 70s toys. You know, on the 60s side, you've got Creature Soki, Mark's Robot Frankenstein, and a, and a Wolfman Soki. 
Then on the 70s side, you got a high creature, Wolfman, Frankenstein. So I, I consider these collectible. Uh, in, in, or collector collectibles. I consider these to be collectibles. It's like uh, having a concert poster, you know, or promotional material for a concert or event. Uh, I consider that. I, I think we we created a collectible. That's what I'm trying to say. If you were there in 2007 and, and you saw that display, then you had an opportunity to buy those buttons. And you, you heard me say in the video something about how the buttons were all sold out. I think Max is asking me about buttons. I'm saying I just sold the last one. Well, that's what I'm talking about, those buttons. Okay. Hmm. There's other stuff I could have for show and tell, but those are those were handy. Well, we've got a big show and tell at the end of the video, so don't go away. Uh, so, I'm going to show a little montage of images from some other other appearances of the display. And it shows all the different, well, not all the different people, but many of the people who worked on the different displays over the years and some of the different ideas we had. Uh, for instance, I was telling you about Elizabeth and her husband Dave, <clears throat> and then uh, Clint from Acme, Acme Design in Elgin, Illinois. I'll talk more about them in a, a little bit. But uh, they they fabricated this newsstand, which you're going to see in some of the photos. <coughs> it it's supposed to harken back to when you could go to a like a sidewalk newsstand, and you could see the famous monsters magazine and other other monster horror magazines on the racks at the newsstand. So they made this fake newsstand. I don't remember what it was made out of, but they fabricated it on site. And they made all these fake magazine covers, scanned from real magazines, but there wasn't, um, you couldn't open it. <coughs> and they put them all in these, what looked like racks. So you, it, looked like, it looked like a newsstand, but it was all imaginary. And we kind of like that aesthetic. Uh, like for instance, let's just say theoretically we could have got a real newsstand somehow, and we could have got uh, a couple hundred real magazines and a real rack, real vintage monster magazines. I would not have wanted to do that even if we could, because that was against the aesthetic. I wanted that artificiality, uh, because in my mind that's kind of what a, a museum experience, this that kind of museum experience was all about, was the kind of um, almost like an uncanny valley sort of uh, real real but unreal um, it, it was a, it was a certain vibe we were going for so we, we wanted things to be fabricated uh, still not not the toys those are genuine those are real but we wanted the all the fixtures and things to have a kind of fabricated unreal sort of quality yeah it's it's hard to explain but we were going for a certain thing, and I think we I think we achieved it. And also, you'll see oh some <clears throat> some looks looks like sketches against a black background. We had a UMA member named Linda Miller who was very well liked and uh, came to uh, I think the at least the first display. I think she was at a couple of the of our display appearances, but then she passed away. Uh, and we, she was an artist, so we wanted to showcase some of her art. And she would she would draw uh, sketches of, of classic horror characters. So we did a little exhibit of, of some of her drawings. We made we scanned them and then made prints of them and mounted them on foam core, and then mounted that against another black background and did a couple of text panels. So uh, if you see some images of pictures and some of the drawings that's what that is that's the linda miller art exhibit and i think everything else is 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 pretty self-explanatory you're going to see obviously it's just the display different times and places and people working on it and putting it up and putting it together so with with that 
uh, explanation, giving you context for what you're about to see. Let's roll it. That gives you an idea of some of the work that went into building the display and, and a little bit of the variety of what it looked like over the years, how it changed in subtle ways. But then it changed drastically for its final year in 2012. So I want to take a minute to talk about what happened in 2012. I, w I went into 2012 uh, really expecting that to be the grand finale of our UMA toy tour. This was the this was the end. We were going to go out with a bang, and we'd been wanting to get to the West Coast, uh, to the the Los Angeles or the Hollywood area, for a long time. And finally, the opportunity arose to bring the display to Monster Palooza in Burbank. Burbank, California. And if you've never been to Burbank, it's in the Los Angeles area. So, I mean, if you ever watched the old Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, he would always say that they were broadcasting live from beautiful downtown Burbank. It was a, it was a joke. Kind of like the way Sven always jokes about Berwin, 
well, that's kind of Johnny Carson's Berwin was Burbank. He would always joke about it. <clears throat> and I mentioned Svengulli because he's going to come up again in a second. So, uh, this was quite an opportunity. We were invited. We were guests of the show. And we had a comped hotel room. Uh, I think... I, I th- I want to say we had just one comp hotel room. We might have had more than one room because we, we had quite an entourage that had to come to make this thing happen. Uh, and I, we, we didn't want to do the old display. We wanted a brand new experience. And what we decided to do was to recreate a famous photograph called the Monster Corner. And here's that photograph. This was a hobby store in the 60s that got some media attention. It was hosting, I believe it was uh, the Aurora uh, Monster Model Maker Contest. I think that's what it was all about. And I, I, I think it got some national publicity uh, in, in print and also on TV, I think, um, well, I think National News came and, and did a piece on this hobby store. But anyway, this, this photo of the owner of the store standing with this Monster Corner sign is kind of iconic in classic horror circles, uh, in collector circles. And we really wanted to recreate this image. And this is what we did. We recreated it at Monster Palooza. Now, it's, of course, it's not an exact match, but you can see the inspiration and, and how close we got. The idea was to create a, uh, a hobby store a 60s hobby store at the convention is similarly to how we did the uh, uh, the newsstand. And it was the same people who really took charge of making this happen, just like the newsstand, which which turned out to be kind of like a, a dry run for this. We That wasn't the idea, but that's how it kind of worked out. Yeah, Elizabeth and Dave and the the team at uh, at Acme that worked on the newsstand also fabricated the hobby store display. Uh, now, Acme Design in Elgin is the same company that made the current set for Svengulli. So that that coffin he has with the with the skull face that with the mouth that opens and closes uh, and the gargoyles on the walls and the bubbling lab equipment and that whole set that he's got right now that was all made by Acme Design in Elgin, Illinois. So if you watch. Svengulli now on MeTV and look at his set. The people who made that set, the same people made our set, our hobby store set for this display at Monster Palooza. And uh, like I said, I, 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 I toured the uh, Acme shop and saw what they could do. And then I was also able to, to travel to Burbank and visit the hotel where this convention was going to be held the year before. It helped that I was able to visit the space and stand there and say, okay, this is what we got. This is where we're going to be. Whatever we make, it's going to have to live inside of here. So we spent several months, uh, or Acme spent several months designing this thing. Uh, designing all the, the the fake packages and signage, and, and, and creating this this window that uh, when you're standing in it, it, it when you're standing in the, in the display, 
it looks like you're looking out the window and there's a neon sign for the, for the store in the window. So all that has to be backward. And then there has to be like a street scene outside the window that looks like something from the 60s. It doesn't have anything anachronistic on it. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Dan Roebuck helped a lot in, in logistics. Uh, he arranged for the the cabinet fixtures that we rented. We didn't make those. We rented them. And they're very industrial sort of things like you might find at a hobby shop. Uh, and he did a lot of other... He was our liaison for a lot of different things. Um, he helped a lot with uh, shipping arrangements and you know, all, all kinds of stuff. Uh, Dan was very, very helpful. Um, so, the the centerpiece of this <laughs> this uh, display, the centerpiece, was a giant version of the Marx battery operator Frankenstein, which is about, eh, I don't know, 12, 14, about 14 inches tall, I think. You know, about so big. And I wanted one that was like five or six feet tall. I wanted like a, a life-size Marx Frankenstein. And the idea was that it would be uh, a display piece that Marx sent to all the stores that would carry the robot they that marks made this this is all fantasy of course this is like a what if what if fantasy piece what if marks made this uh, this elaborate display piece this giant frankenstein to send all the stores that were selling it uh like maybe for for christmas uh, in the 60s and um and the idea was that they would set it up with a display of all the the, the boxed Frankenstein robots. So we made, or Acme, Acme made this giant Frankenstein. I think it ended up being roughly five feet tall. And, uh, you're you're going to see it in a minute. Uh, you, you need, it's not as tall as me. It's like maybe to my shoulders or something. And uh, it's three-dimensional. It, they, they took my Marx Frankenstein and Dan Roebuck's Marx Frankenstein and scanned them both and combined the two. The body is in arms and legs are Dan's and the head and the hands are mine. The the scans. Uh, you know, the, 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 the body and everything is scanned from Dan's toy and the head and the hands are scanned from my toy. And then they fabricated this giant thing in their shop uh, it's got a styrofoam inner core with a resin outer layer, and that they they were able to take the scan and put it in a computer, and the computer told a, a cutting device how to cut this these blocks of foam in this exact shape with minute detail, and they sprayed it with this hard coat, this resin, and then sanded it down, and then they painted it to match the toy and the result it does look like some mad scientist took a, a ray gun that could make things big or small and shot that Marx Frankenstein and made it turn giant it, they did an excellent job and it really does it looks like a giant version of that toy it looks it looks great as you, you'll see uh, and you can see in, in photos from that event how good it looks and then they also made a bunch of dummy boxes for the Marx Frankenstein, for the robot. So, uh, I, I think they're my box, I think, that we, we, we took scans of my box for my toy and constructed fake boxes. And I don't remember what's inside, they're foam inside the box, they're not hollow. They're, they're blocks, I think. I don't, they're not hollow. They're uh, either foam or cardboard. But uh, uh, anyway, the, they, they, they attached the panels to the outside, and they created all these little dummy boxes that look real. To the naked eye, it looks like a bunch of Marx Frankenstein boxes. And so we made this, uh, 
display where all these boxes are arranged in a circle with this giant display piece on top. Now, of course, there was never anything like that uh, in the 60s. Marx would never have made <laughs> something that elaborate. Uh, that that would be like uh, an upscale toy at FAO Schwartz, maybe, would have gotten that kind of treatment. But it's it's just a what if. It's a fun little what if this this they did this. <sighs> now that that big Frankenstein was um, quite a draw, and I knew it would be. Uh, everyone at that show walked by. They they wanted to get their picture taken with that Frankenstein, and we had a, a lot of notable people come by and and pose for pictures with that Frankenstein. As he had in the past, Bob Burns stopped by. He actually lives in Burbank, so this was very convenient for him. That might be the last time I ever saw him. He's still alive, but I mean, I don't think I've seen him since then, 2012, when he was at the display. But he, he posed for some cool photos. Uh, that, I mean, they're really neat, neat looking photos. And we had other people, all of, like uh, Mark Huckabone, you might have, if you ever saw Toy Hunter, he was on that show. Uh, I know Mark from way back. A lot of my monster toys that I bought in the 90s came from Mark. And uh, that was the first time I'd ever met him in person. I talked to him on the phone many times, but first time I ever met him in person. Carrie Gamble, uh, a well-known comic illustrator, stopped by. And I, I've Carrie, Carrie was a member of the Classic Horror Film Board, so I knew him back from those days. And I'd actually met him before visiting... Los Angeles, so uh, and he'd been to Wonder Fest several times, so I, I knew Kerry. It was good to see him again. It was a very rewarding experience. It was a lot of work. Uh, took a lot of planning. Uh, we were all exhausted that weekend. I mean, we were dead on our feet. But it was a very rewarding weekend, and I think we all came away came away with a sense of accomplishment. There was a we had a lot of fun. It wasn't all work. It was fun. Uh, there was a live TV broadcast from our display when the show opened that that first morning. Uh, they had like a morning show, a TV morning show in the area, and they had a reporter, you know, standing there at our display. And they kept throughout the hour in this morning show, they kept coming back to her. And they had, I think, some packages they had pre-prepared that they would cut to. But they keep, they keep coming back to her and me. I was standing next to her. And I I, I think I knew that something like this was going to happen because I had a suit and a tie, I, I think. Or, or I don't know if I had the tie, but I had a suit top. I was dressed. Uh, so I think I, I was expecting. I think I had, I was told this was going to happen. So I was standing next to her with this this morning show, and they do the thing in the studio, and they come back to her. Yeah, we're here at Monster Palooza, and then every now and then she talked to me a little bit, and I talk about monsters or, or fandom, or then I I went to the display, and kind of showed her around, and they shot some video of that live on on television. And I've never seen that footage. I don't know if it... I tried searching for it online. It doesn't seem to exist online. I don't know. I don't know the name of the station. I don't even know how to go about trying to get that. I'd love to see it again. If I if I could, I would have had it here for this this episode, but I, I couldn't even... I couldn't find it. Maybe it's out there somewhere. It'd be nice to see it. Um, then trying to pack all this stuff up at the end of the weekend and ship it home. That was something. Uh, my, I, I stayed in Burbank two extra days. <laughs> the show ended Sunday. I didn't leave until Tuesday. And the reason I did that was because I knew I'd have, because everyone else left. And I knew that was going to happen. That uh, Everyone else left on Sunday. Well, there was a ton of stuff to ship back and I knew I was going to have to do it. So everyone gave me their stuff and all went into my hotel room and I spent all of Monday I didn't leave the hotel all day. I just 
packed and packed and packed and packed and packed and packed and packed. Woo! And I got everyone's stuff packed back up. And then Tuesday, I had a late flight. So I spent the morning going to... One person wanted the post office. Another person wanted FedEx. Another person wanted UPS. So I had to go to three different places to to drop this stuff off and ship it off. Uh, and uh, I shipped my stuff back home overnight. And that was that's another story for another day. What happened because of that? Uh, let's just say I had federal agents visited my home the next day because I shipped those boxes overnight. These big boxes, and they were expensive. And I don't know if they thought it was drugs or weapons. Or I don't know what they were thinking. That was, that was not fun to have federal agents show up at your door. And then they discovered that the boxes were just full of monster toys. Someday I'll go into more detail because it really wasn't funny. It really wasn't funny. Uh, it wasn't a laughing matter, and it shouldn't have happened. Uh, and, and some of my ideas about, well, I, I'll, I'll get political <laughs> if I go any further. But if I wasn't sour and cynical about certain things already, that experience solidified my cynicism. But that I'll, that's not for today. That's serious <laughs> downbeat talk for another day but that so that's how the, the weekend ended when I came home I came home to find federal agents <laughs> showing up because I shipped these monster toys overnight back to my house Woo, okay uh, so that was the penultimate uh, dis display you, you may display Toy Tour Stop. That was March of 2012. Then the final one, the final Toy Tour, you may display Toy Tour appearance, was at the 2012 Mask Fest at Horror Hound, Indianapolis. And this was the third time we'd been to Horror Hound. Uh, for the display. I still go to Horror Hound. I go every year. That's the only convention I do go to every year. But I started going because of the display. Uh, and we were, again, we were guests of the show. And this was almost a two-person job. Whereas the the uh, Monster Palooza was a big team effort. The final one at Mask Fest, Mask Fest is like a show within a show. There's like Horror Hounds, the big convention, and Mask Fest is like a sub convention inside of Horror, of Horror Hound. So, whereas the Monster Palooza was a big production with a big team effort, uh, Mask Fest was more personal, more of a, it was more of a personal project between Bobby Beeman and myself. Other people helped. I mean, uh, Andy Williams, uh, Brian Collenberg, uh, several several people helped. But in terms of planning it out and everything, it was really Bobby and I that executed that. It was a, a very personal vision for the two of us. And we we got the old display fixtures that you saw in the video. Uh, added some new fixtures, but relied more on on like the black towers from the old display. We we had those back, but then we had some new things, some new cases and things that we added to it. And it was a two part display, and it was very long. I don't know how many feet long this thing was. It, it took up a good section of one wall of the of the room of the of the this big kind of a dealer room where Mask Fest was held. Um, gosh, I don't know how many feet it must have been. 100 feet, I don't know, it was huge. It was a very, very long, long display because it was in different sections. So Bobby's section was mostly Don Post Studios. And we had done Don Post before. We actually had Don Post Jr. at the show before looking at our display. And he liked it very much. The, the 
a previous one. So we had, we had featured Don Post before, but this was more intensive. This was more serious. This is Bobby's section. This is the, this is this part Bobby spearheaded. It was uh, a history of Don Post masks, but more than that, it was it was a little focused on Don Post. It was more the history of monster masks and and, and mask mask like items. Part of this display was uh, an original 1943 theater display for Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. When Universal released Frankenstein meets the Wolfman, some theaters had this display with a Frankenstein head and a Wolfman head and two Frankenstein arms and Wolfman arms and some sort of like um, like shoulders and like a shirt top or something. So it was like from the chest up and the two monsters battling each other, three dimension like dummies of the two monsters battling each other. That would be like above the ticket window or, or someplace conspicuous. And Bobby had one of those. He, he didn't have all the different parts, but he had the main ones. He had the, the two heads and the two pairs of hands. So he had the important parts. So he set that up like it would have been originally. It had a background that kind of suggested, uh, like he took a photograph of the 1943 display and put that in the background so people could see it in context, what it would look like. And that was really something. That, that's, that was an historically important display. No one had ever seen anything like that in person since 1943. And then Pete Infeliz, who is a, a great mask maker and mask collector, he donated, a, uh, not a complete set, but he, he donated several 1960s Alice Berman Sr. monster masks. These Berman masks are legendary. You saw them on TV all the time back in the day in the 60s. Like uh, All kinds of TV shows used these masks, but hardly any of them survived to the present day. I mean, almost none. Pete's, uh, I, I think there's one other collector that has one or something, and that's it. And then, and then there's the ones that Pete owns, and that's, that's it. And there's no more that anyone knows about. And uh, most of them were sold through Burt Wheeler's magic shop in Los Angeles. And the ones that Pete has, ha they have the Burt Wheeler stamp on the inside of the mask. So these are rare, rare, rare pieces. Super rare. Uh, and so it was quite... Uh, it was a big deal to have those masks in the display. And there were all kinds of other great things in, in Bobby's uh, Don Post-centric half of the display. And, and he had a life-size Dracula uh, where he had like a Don, I think it was a Don Post head, and then a tuxedo and a cape and everything. And then uh, we had a computer where people could look at the actual UMA, uh, the actual site, and I think they could sign up and become a member right then and there. And we've been wanting to do something like that for a long time. And it really took to the very end before we finally got the kinks out. And I, I, there were still some kinks, but we finally got something that actually worked up and running that looked right. Finally, at the very end, we, we got it. My half of the, of the display was the tomb of the Top Stones. So, you know, I've got a video series called Tomb of the Top Stones that was inspired by this display, the Tomb of the Top Stones display at 2012 Mask Fest. Uh, so I made this big backdrop with graphics and I had uh, a case, uh, a, a new case, glass case for the vacuum form top stones and then I had the old black display you may display towers that had other uh, foamed latex top stone masks and they had big text panels that had video I, I, I bought uh, 
digital picture frames used to be kind of a fad. Well, I used them for video instead of like, a, well, I also had still photos that, photos that rotated as well, but I also had video. So I had all kinds of clips from movies and things that used Topstone masks in the films. And you, you saw the clips playing on these little monitors, or you saw all the different advertisements and catalog images, uh, rotating images of that. On, so there were two monitors and, and big text panels. So there was, again, there was this sort of, uh, there was this multimedia aspect. There was like Bobby with the computer and the Tomb of the Top Stones with the video monitors. And I really liked the Tomb of the Top Stones display. I, I thought aesthetically it really looked good. I, I, I liked the way it all turned out visually. And I liked the selection of masks that I had. Uh, just a few years later, I, I could have done a much better display because I got several important masks over the next three or four years that I didn't have in 2012. But with what I had, I think it turned out pretty darn good. And again, no one had ever seen anything like that before. There was never been a serious display that comprehensive of vintage top stone masks with all that information and everything. So I was very proud of that 2012 display. I was proud of my contribution with the top stones. I was proud to be involved with Bobby's uh, part with, with, with Don Post just by, associ by association, although I didn't work on his part at all, just to be part of that project. Um, I was very proud to be part of it. Uh, and I think it turned out really good. Uh, and I thought that this is a good time to step away and, and call it an era. And that was the last display. That was the final UMA display. So those two, the the Burbank Monster Palooza one with the hobby shop, and the Mask Fest Indianapolis one with the Tomb of the Top Stones and the Don Post and Berman and Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. Those two displays, I think, were the best we ever did. And then I think like um, after that would be the 2007 one that you saw in the video. And then the toy tour came to an end. And it was a fitting end. It was a good end. I think it ended on a high note and we quit while we were ahead. And I don't think we, if we kept going, I don't think we would have topped what we'd done. I, I think... Every, everything was getting a little threadbare by then. Just it, it, money, resources, personalities, everything. Just everything was kind of reaching its limit by 2012. It, I, I don't think we could have pushed it another year or two. I think it would have, I think we would have stumbled, fallen over. And I know I, I didn't want to do it again another year. Um, and there was a lot of expense involved and, I didn't think we could raise any more money to keep this going. It, was, it, it all cost a lot of money. And even getting the free hotel rooms and the free space, and a lot of people working in kind, donating their services, it still costs a lot of money every year. <sighs> so I'm still a member of the Universal Monster Army, technically, and I still post... Uh, I post these videos, but that's about all I do. I don't really post anything else. Times moved on, and a lot of the people that I associated with at the UMA are, are not active there anymore. In fact, hardly any of the people that I closely associated with are, are still there actively. Uh, I probably should leave, leave it at that, but... Uh, social media came along, Facebook particularly, and a lot of the people who used to post at UMA now post on Facebook. And a lot of uh, the kind of community we got out of the UMA experience 
we're now getting out of groups on Facebook. There are a lot of mask collecting groups, monster toy collecting groups, all kinds of different groups on Facebook. And that's where the action is right now. That's just, that's just the way it is. You know, time marches on. Uh, we went from the old bulletin boards on AOL and Yahoo to the website forums, the standalone forums, and then to things like Facebook, to social media. And eventually, Facebook will die and there'll be something else. And things will just keep moving on. But even though I'm not really active at UMA and the people that I've been talking about are not really active there anymore, it's still around. So if you're watching this, and you're interested, go to UMA, go to the Universal Monster Army and become a member. And, uh, you know, it, each generation has to step aside and let a new generation have its day. And that's kind of what's happened. The, the generation I represented kind of stepped back and went to someplace else. And it's time for another group to come in and, and have their day in the spotlight. So that could be you. Go to the Universal Monster Army, and there's plenty of good people there. Get involved, mix it up, and see what happens. Mike Scott is the guy who keeps it running these days. He's the, he's the primary moderator, and he does a great job keeping that, that site afloat. He does a lot of work. And uh, I take my hat off to him. He, he's doing a fantastic job carrying on. Okay, so now we're going to move some things away. And I'm going to show you that big Mark's Frankenstein. And then that will bring this episode to a close. So we'll come back and you will see the pieces of this Mark's Frankenstein and we'll put it together before your very eyes. Hello. We've made a little set change and now we're back. Uh, so, I've been shooting this episode in installments. So, this is the third chunk of this episode that I've shot. And I, I've done it over the period of about, I don't know, 10 days or so. And since I began, we now have a worldwide pandemic. Anyone watching this when it first uploads will know that we're dealing with the coronavirus all around the world. And we were dealing with it when I started, but it hadn't quite escalated to the point where it's at now. So between the time that I started shooting, like when you saw me, I guess it's what, almost 90 minutes ago, when you saw me sitting there, hello, welcome to Babe Sumanafar, to this point now, the whole world has changed <laughs> in, that, in that span of time from when you saw me at the beginning of the show to now. We're in a different world now. So a lot has happened. I was editing uh, some of the footage earlier and I, I noticed that uh, I look kind of sick. I'm coughing and my voice is kind of strained and I don't look good. Uh, I don't think I'm sick. I don't feel sick. But I was looking at that footage and I said, that guy on, that, on the screen there, he does not look good. He looks like he's sick. So I hope he feels better, that guy <laughs> on the screen. But uh, I, feel, I feel okay. I don't think I'm sick. I uh, hope not, but we, we've got all kinds of things going on. We've got, whoo, everyone's kind of on lockdown. Restaurants and bars are, well, if they're not closing, they might as well close because there's nobody, nobody there, no one going to them. Uh, all the schools in my area are closed for the next uh, three weeks. Wow. The place where I work, um, I don't know yet as I sit here right now whether we're going to close or not. 
but it wouldn't surprise me if we did. Uh, everything's closing. Everyone's hunkering down. So that's interesting. Uh, kind of reminds me of 9-11. If you weren't old enough to remember that, well, I'll take my word, uh, it, it kind of had that same feeling. The, these kinds of events always remind me of Night of the Living Dead when they're watching the news reports and as the reports come in those very straight-faced anchor people on the TV set or on the radio their the reports become more and more surreal and alarming and it just escalates and escalates and uh, and people are, are trying to deal with it and get a handle on it but it just falls apart so I just, being a horror guy, I always think of Night of the Living Dead and Dawn of the Dead and those kinds of films. So, so a lot's happening. It's only been an hour and 20 minutes or so while you've been watching this, but for me, it's been a couple of weeks of, of watching the world kind of fall apart from something to be concerned about, but don't, don't panic do worse and worse and worse to perhaps a society changing crisis. So that's just an observation. I'm shooting this in case you, you're watching this in the future sometime. I'm shooting this in March of 2020. So all the segments I've done on this have all been shot in March of 2020. And uh, if this is years, if you're watching this years from now, and you're thinking, what's he talking about? There was this big uh, crisis around the world with this virus, the coronavirus, that was making a lot of people sick and there wasn't uh, any effective treatment yet. There wasn't a vaccine yet and it was very contagious and people were dying all over the world and countries were cracking down, closing businesses and restricting travel. So this is all that's happening right now. Okay, let's see here. This is the that big Frankenstein, that big Marx Frankenstein that you saw in some of the photos in the segment where I'm talking about Monster Palooza. Oh, and by the way, if the audio is different, you notice I don't have my studio microphone. It just wouldn't work in this environment. So I've got my lavalier and I've got an on-camera mic, a shotgun mic over there. So the, the audio probably is not going to be as good. Sorry about that, but it's the best I can do. But anyway, you saw the big Marx Frankenstein in the Monster Palooza segment. So that's what we have here in, the, in all this bubble wrap. And it's been in this bubble wrap since 2012. After I came, well, I had it shipped back to me after Monster Palooza. I unwrapped the bubble wrap just to show a friend what it looked like. I took it to his house and, and I assembled it. And uh, it was Andy Williams and his little daughter Mia. I'll just put the picture up. Uh, his little daughter Mia posed next to it. And she's, she's much older now. She's a teenager now. But uh, you can see how little she was alongside this big Frankenstein. Okay, so after that night, I wrapped it all back up in this bubble wrap. And it, that was 2012, and it hasn't been out of this bubble wrap since then. So that's, wow, that's eight years. Yikes. That's something, eight years. So today we're going to take it out of this bubble wrap and see what happens uh, and try to bring this Frankenstein back to life. And it's very dusty, so my black clothes are gonna get white dust all over them. In fact, I've already, just from putting these things here, I already had to try to wipe the dust off myself just to start shooting this, but it's all gonna get dusty again. Okay, here we go. Come on. Yep. 
<laughs> there it goes already. Yikes, look at it. It's, it's just going to get dusty. There's no, no way around it. Okay, so here is the body. Here's the body. And it even has this little, this looks, it's like almost like rockets on the back. See that? That's because the Marx Frankenstein robot has those little rocket shapes on the back because the same body was used for other robots that were more sci-fi, more robot oriented that had things like rockets. So Marx used the same body for a lot of things. So Frankenstein has little, like little rockets on his back. All right, let's set him. Where are we gonna set him? Let's get this bull wrap out of here. Okay. Uh, be careful. All right. Okay. Um, yeah, let's do this. Let's do a do his leg. This is a leg. Let's set this down. Now, I could have just assembled him and just let you see the finished thing all set up. But for some reason, I don't know, I just thought it'd be interesting to see, for you to see it coming together. Ugh. Yuck. Dust, dust, dust. So here's one of his legs. Here's a leg. Well, it's a foot. I mean, it's his leg and his foot. You can see it's, he's got wheels. Well, I mean, the suggestion of wheels on the bottom of his feet. So he didn't have to do that. But they went that extra step to make it realistic. Now the wheels don't, the wheels don't roll. But it's interest, interesting that he has them. So I, I, like I said, I just thought it'd be kind of interesting for you to see see it coming together. And maybe I'd think of something interesting to say while I'm doing this. But uh, so far, not not really. I mean, nothing brilliant is coming to mind. You know, I've talked about. In the in the, in the uh, monsters at home video, I talked about how this season was kind of dramatic with uh, with me getting injured and sick, and my cat getting sick, and the kappa problem and all that stuff. And I said, oh, hopefully now the crisis is all over. Nope. <laughs> nope. Now we got a worldwide pandemic. So it's a good thing this season ends with this episode. This is the last episode after like a, well, I guess it's going to end up being like a month break since the last episode, because this is taking a long time to produce this episode. But now finally, this is the last episode of the season. Hopefully the crises will be over. I hope. I hope we don't have any more crises. I mean, besides a meteor hitting the earth, I don't know what else could happen. Maybe that'll happen. I don't know. 
So here's the other, the other leg and foot. See the little wheels, and that's how it fits on. No, oh, don't want to do that. Now let's put him over here. Okay. Let's do the head now. So the head, I was surprised I had not sealed up the head, which is one of the most critical parts, but I, he's not sealed. So here, here's the head, and he's got little cushions on his bolts. Don't want to forget those. I'm going to put those over there. Got little cushions on his bolts. Well, I took them off now, but to to protect his little bolts, he had little little coverings on them. So you can see that's a Marx Frankenstein head modeled off of the off the toy, and it looks just like it. I mean, it's scanned, three D scanned from the toy. So it's an exact copy just blown up. Oh, uh, where, where shall I put him? Right there. Okay. All right, now the arms are, I guess the biggest, maybe not the bulkiest, because the body's bulkiest, but the, the longest and the most fragile part of this whole thing. Here's one of his arms. <sighs> okay, here's one of his arms. Don't want to drop it. And you can see the hand, it appears to be a separate piece. I don't know if it is or if it's just made to look that way. But uh, they even copied the wrinkle in the vinyl. Of the, because the hands are made of vinyl, the rest is made of tin. But see how the, there's like a little wrinkle, like a little stress wrinkle? And over here, you can see the little wrinkle there. They even copied that from the toy. So that every little detail is copied in the, you can see how it's painted to look just like the real toy. And even these little tabs are on the toy that uh, hold the different tin pieces together. They're like little bolts or fasteners. So he, this is a delicate piece, uh, both these arms are, because of these fingers, I'm always worried these, I, I was worried that the fingers would break off some time ago when I was packing this up for the show, shipping it, I mean the thing that most concerned me was that these fingers wouldn't make it. Oh, but look at this. So on the actual toy, this part's made of rubber. It's a flexible part in between the shoulders and the body. And this mimics that, that accordion kind of rubber, accordion shape, so it, it flexes. All right, one more piece. them together. And I like that I don't have to cut any tape for these pieces. I think when I pack them back up, I'm not going to re-tape them. I'm going to try to pack them up without tape. Okay, here's the final arm. Or the final final piece, the second arm final piece of the toy. 
and they've really replicated that Lith the uh, lithography on the tin, they perfectly replicated it in this paint. And the way they, they had a different texture for the hands versus the arm. This is very flat, matte texture. This is glossy, just like the, the coated metal tin arm versus the vinyl hand. Pretty cute. I like them. Here's the faux rubber part. And again, this is also, this is flat matte surface instead of shiny. So they, they, they thought of everything with the, trying to maintain the accuracy, all these different pieces. All right, now we need to put them together. I might have to at some point stop the recording to readjust the cameras. All right, so this, that's that leg. And this other leg. Yeah, I'm gonna have to readjust the cameras, I think. Okay. It's coming together. Ah, let's see here. Gotta be careful with it. Okay, I think that's, that's as good as it needs to be for now. It's not quite right. <clears throat> Let's see, he's right there. Okay. Right. This one on. Okay. All right. Last piece.
let's uh, adjust the camera a little bit. Okay. Here he is, the giant Marx Frankenstein. There he is. And he has some limited posability. I don't want to move him around too much. I mean, he is delicate. He's, he's not something made to be played with. He's a display piece. And there's already little, just from the couple times he's been assembled, deassembled, there's little bits that are kind of chipping off here and there where the joints come together. So he's something. It, if, if I had a place to display him permanently, I would, but I would have to make some modifications to keep him from uh, being damaged by his own weight, like the uh, the arm. Uh, I know these joints in time, just from the weight of the arm, these joints would be damaged, so I'd have to make some modifications, uh, perhaps glue him together permanently. Uh, I might, you know, I might have to do that if I were if I were ever to just display him. I don't display him; I keep him stored. But if I'm going to display him, I would probably modify the joints so that uh, uh, they, everything was fixed permanently and, and then that would help with the weight not tearing on certain areas because uh, yeah the the arms particularly they're heavy and they kind of they could damage the joints in time but he's pretty cool and and he does things that toy doesn't do like the toy's head doesn't move or at least it's not supposed to his does so you can see how tall he is uh i i think i overestimated his height when i was speaking earlier i said he was like five feet tall he's not he's about i don't know four feet or so maybe a little a little taller than four feet um let's see like maybe four and a half feet tall thereabouts. He's an impressive piece. As far as I know, well, not as far as I know, I can tell you for sure, he's the only one of his kind. There's not another one of these in the world. He is the only one. Now, could Acme make another one? Yes, yes, they could. They still have the files, I'm sure, uh, in their computer. Uh, but someone would have to pay for it. They wouldn't do it for free. Uh, let's see. I love looking at the little hand-painted details. They really did a good job. There's, there's hand-painted details and then airbrush and just a mix of techniques. But a lot of it is hand painted. You can tell up close it's hand painted to make it look exactly right. And his little his hair, everything. Well, here he is. Giant, giant Marx Frankenstein. You're not going to see another one of these. Very unlikely. Unless Acme makes another one. You're not going to see another one of these one of a kind display piece you know there's a book with uh grover from the you know from sesame street called the monster at the end of this book you know after watching this episode for an hour and some minutes 90 minutes this is the monster at the end of this episode if you made it this far if you stayed with me to the end of this thing, thank you very much. I admire your fortitude and determination. Thank you. And so now here is the little treat at the end of the episode. He is cool and he is hard. Uh, inside he, he's made of styrofoam inside the core of styrofoam but he's resin on the outside so they 
scanned them into a computer and then the computer controlled a cutting device with big blocks of styrofoam and cut it exactly right. And they went in and did a little fine correction. They spray coated it with resin all over. And then they went into that and did a little sanding and then they painted it. And here he is. Well, that's it for Raymond Castile's Basement of Horror, Season 2. This is the end. The show will be off for a while. We might have some specials, I don't know. Uh, it'll come back, I hope, later in the year, as long as civilization is still here. And we haven't all reverted to... Mad Max or Walking Dead times and there's the United States and human civilization still exists in a few months, then Raymond Castile's Basement of Horror will return. Like James Bond, it will return. Thank you very much for watching the season. Remember, if you haven't already, vote for the Rondo Awards, the Rondo Hatton Awards. Vote for the Rondos. And if you would, please consider voting for Raymond Castile's Basement of Horror as best multimedia presentation. Oh, multimedia website. That's the category name. Well, until I see you again, Thanks a lot, and remember, he who dies with the most toys is dead.